traffic this morning along the Kiwi Gardner, Guy Valentine. Well, it's a bit of a battle for drivers without cover. I'm talking if you don't have any shade because you're fighting some pretty bright sunshine. And also caution on Highway 7 going east of Bay. And northbound Don Valley Parkway on the ramp to eastbound 401. We've got a disabled vehicle. June the 14th, 2002. It was just another busy workday with all the usual hustle and congestion. With all the close calls and near misses that people all over the world have come to accept as the normal level of risk in everyday life. But on that day, high overhead and behind the sun, what no one saw coming. What no telescope on Earth was able to see against the blinding light was an asteroid big enough to destroy an entire city. From behind the sun, asteroid 2002 MN came hurtling towards Earth faster than a speeding bullet. It shot past less than a third the distance to the moon and nobody saw it until three days later when the rock emerged from Earth's shadow into the night sky going away. It looks like the Earth just dodged a bullet. Actually, it was an asteroid. Scientists say it blew by last week at a distance they describe as a close shave. The airline industry would call this a near miss. Scientists who study asteroids and comets called it a problem. The threat of asteroid impacts on the Earth is very real. We know that throughout history this has happened. The craters we see on the moon are examples of the kind of impact history that the Earth has had. But it also happens very rarely. So it's a very unusual kind of hazard. It's a hazard in which the risk in any one year is very low, but it does happen and if it really did come about on our watch, it could end civilization. These cosmic bullets originate on the far side of Mars, in the main asteroid belt, where a bracelet of celestial debris circles the sun. Millions of rocky fragments, building blocks of a planet that never quite came together when the solar system was formed. What's often depicted as a busy cosmic junkyard is actually more like a big empty speedway. The rocks are far apart and moving very fast ranging in size from pebbles to boulders to rocks the size of Mount Everest. Occasionally, the tug of Jupiter's enormous gravity drags an asteroid off course, causing it to crash into another asteroid. Some veer away into new orbits that cross the paths of Mars, Earth, Venus or Mercury. Another ring of debris called the Oort Cloud is the source of most comets, which are big, rocky ice balls that orbit the Sun and cross the paths of the inner planets. All the inner planets and our Moon bear the scars of numerous asteroid and comet impacts. We do get hit all the time by pieces of debris from asteroids and comets. In fact, 40,000 tonnes of cosmic debris plummets into the atmosphere every year. We see them every night as shooting stars. They don't hit the Earth very often, but when they do, clearly it isn't just going to be a matter of a shooting star seen in the sky. So it is inevitable. It's only a matter of time before the next big one hits us. Even small rocks can make a big impression. In 1908, about 2,000 square kilometers of Siberian forest were instantly flattened as an asteroid exploded near the Tonguska River. The impact site was so remote, researchers had to mount a wilderness expedition just to find the place. When they arrived, there was no crater. Paintings, based on eyewitness accounts, described a fireball. A horrendous explosion in the sky didn't actually come crashing down to the ground. It exploded uh, maybe uh, five to ten kilometers up in the atmosphere. Uh, and that made a big blast wave in the atmosphere. And, and that is what did the damage. 
All this was caused by a relatively small asteroid, somewhere between 50 and 100 meters across. Roughly the same size as asteroid 2002 MN, the one we couldn't see coming. Tunguska's 2,000 square kilometer blast wave would have leveled London. But as bleak as the thought of cosmic collision may be, there is at least a glimmer of hope. One of the special things about the asteroid impact problem is that unlike the weather or earthquakes or other natural hazards, we, at least in principle, we could do something about it. And when we know one's coming for us, our claim is that the technology is available today to stop it. On the Earth, we've got active geology, we've got volcanoes, we've got earthquakes, we've got continental drift, we've got rain, we've got wind, we've got storms, we've got snow. All of those things are road away craters, and that, in some ways, actually fools us into thinking that, indeed, the Earth doesn't get hit as often as it actually does. Counting craters on the Moon and then estimating how often the Earth gets hit can be a pretty sobering exercise. One scientist who made that kind of calculation was astronomer Ernst Opik, who published his impact estimate back in 1951. The general public, however, paid little attention to the science or the implications. But one individual who did take the issue to heart was Lembit Opik, the astronomer's grandson, who got himself elected to parliament. My grandfather is the reason why I carried on in politics, what he initiated in science. In essence, uh, he was a pioneer. He saw the danger of asteroid and cometary impacts with the Earth, and he had the courage to speak up about them. And he did that at a time when it wasn't really taken seriously, in the 1950s and 1960s. After years of pushing and prodding, Lembit Opik convinced the British government to commission a comprehensive scientific study of the asteroid and comet threat. The expert conclusion was the threat is indeed real. Now the government has set up a task force to examine the risk of an asteroid hitting the Earth. Still skeptical politicians might want to get on the bus and take a trip to the Natural History Museum. Ask any school child who's been there recently and you'll hear a fascinating and truly scary tale about what happened to the dinosaurs. The dinosaurs were alive here. They were dead when the sediment was deposited. And this layer is one of the most unique layers in Earth history. In 1980, the discovery of iridium beside a layer of clay which marked the end of the age of dinosaurs led Lewis and Walter Alvarez to publish a theory that a huge asteroid or comet had hit the Earth 65 million years ago and wiped out the dinosaurs. But for this concept to be confirmed, there had to be a crater. There may be tons of dinosaur bones in these dry canyons, but where on Earth was the big crater? just the kind of mystery a budding young scientist would love to solve. When I went back to... Off the coast of Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula, Dr. Alan Hildebrand investigated a huge gravity anomaly discovered by oil drillers back in the 1950s. Put that together with a semicircular magnetic anomaly and you get a massive crater, 180 kilometers across, near a little village called Chicxulub Pueblo. Most of the crater is underwater now. Erosion and continental drift have covered the visible evidence. But 65 million years ago, this was ground zero. This object would have fallen through the atmosphere in just a few seconds. If it's going through the sky, it would have been brighter than the sun. As soon as it contacts the surface of the shallow sea and Chipshalu, of course, it starts propagating the shock wave down into the planet and it keeps pushing into the planet and it only gets stopped maybe about 30 kilometers down. The pressure wave would have traveled around the entire planet in the atmosphere. You could have heard the impact on the other side of the planet. The giant impact fireball rising out of the hole, it would have risen say 10,000 kilometers above 
the surface of the planet. Near the impact site, it would have been so hot, it would have evaporated the clouds and been hot enough to make the forest, even a green forest, uh, begin to burn. For Alan Hildebrand, finding that crater pretty much clinched the argument. Planet Earth had been all but sterilized by a rock the size of Mount Everest. Three quarters of the species of large uh, animal life went extinct. We have made the case. We've got the qualitative information and we've got the statistics to show that there is a very serious risk. If you wanted to save planet Earth from cosmic disaster, where would you find people with all the right stuff to do the job? Well, Houston, Texas might be a good place to start looking. This town has that rarest of breeds, the space cowboy. Houston is home to NASA's Johnson Space Center, where rocket science is a way of life and astronauts learn their trade. If you could roll me 90 and then go down, I'll come in on my side. If... Behind a swimming pool big enough to swallow an apartment block, you'll find a small research lab where the rocket engine of the future is being built and bench tested. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very nice. The question is, how big is the plasma going to go from here to here? Dr. Franklin Chang Diaz is one of the lead researchers, as well as an astronaut with seven shuttle missions under his belt. And in fact, there was a time uh, in one of my flights where we got hit by very tiny uh, micro meteorites, perhaps, or, or some sort of orbital debris. Um, which made little tiny dents or little craters in the windows of the shuttle. First-hand experience with rocks in space gave birth to a new idea and a dual purpose to Chang Diaz's work here. His rocket engine has been developed for long-distance missions to Mars or as far away as the icy moons of Jupiter. But it could also be used to push a dangerous asteroid out of harm's way. I am concerned enough to think that we need to uh, not waste time arguing about it uh, as to whether it's real or not. I think we move, we need to move ahead and uh, do them. Well, I'm wild in the hell's ring. Come on, baby, you belong to me. Swing, kiss, with my conscience, but... Well, I'm wild and I am free. Come on, baby, you belong to me. Sweet kiss makes my engine start the way you move. You own my heart. Sweet kiss makes my engine start the way you move. Uh, you own my heart. If if this is a uh... A, a threat which has a very low probability. All it takes is one, and we are history. But before we can send a spacecraft chasing after a rogue asteroid, we have to know where to look for it. In the American West, if you drive across the desert to the White Sands Missile Range in southern New Mexico, you'll find the most powerful and effective asteroid hunter on Earth. Scientists here have tested everything from rockets to the very first atomic bomb. Today, across the valley floor from the Trinity bomb site, the US Air Force has installed one of the world's most advanced telescopes. This state-of-the-art technology was developed by MIT's Lincoln Laboratory as part of the Star Wars anti-missile defense system. These may not be the world's biggest telescopes, 
but they clearly are the best when it comes to finding deadly rocks in space. This is Linear, the Lincoln Near-Earth Asteroid Research Facility. On a given night when we scan the sky with this, we'll find perhaps uh, 10 to 12,000 moving objects in the sky. Now most of those are main belt asteroids and as such don't represent uh, any danger to Earth. But on the other hand, something like half of those will be brand new discoveries and buried in there will be one or two near-Earth objects. Because the Earth rotates, the sky is always moving overhead. To get a clear picture of an asteroid, you have to make the sky stop moving. And you do that with a telescope that can track or follow the stars. This way, you can take time-lapse pictures that isolate the blur of fast-moving asteroids against a crystal-clear sky. It then records these pictures like a TV camera on a computer chip that has 20 times more detail than the picture you're now watching. The linear computer deletes previously known stars and planets leaving a less cluttered time-lapse sequence of the new discoveries. At the end of each night shift, Linear's thousands of new discoveries are emailed to the International Astronomical Union's Minor Planet Center at Harvard University. A team of only three scientists must cope with the avalanche of new sightings, searching for potentially hazardous asteroids or comets. Computers make a rough calculation of an asteroid's orbit, but it's up to Brian Marsden to estimate the level of risk. They may be reporting 50 or 60,000 observations from one night, uh, and it takes a while to, uh, to, to get through that. But so we, we look first at the fast movers uh, and see if there's anything interesting there. H is equal to sine delta. We do sometimes get close to um, 70 or 80,000 observations a day, almost, almost one per second. There are some days when we effectively have one observation per second. Even with fast computers, Marsden's team can make only a preliminary calculation of each asteroid's orbit. Five shots in one night cover only a tiny segment of an asteroid's orbital path. You can't solve for the orbit completely from that, uh, but the fact that you're seeing motion uh, over a, a half an hour or an hour, something like that, does allow us to get a partial solution uh, for the orbit. Refining the orbit gets complicated. When 2002 MN shot past, its trajectory was warped by Earth gravity and scientists at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California, had to add that to their calculations. Here's an animation I put together of the asteroid last year, which was discovered after it passed by the Earth. An elite team of mathematicians and celestial mechanics is now working full-time on a computerized warning system. In our, our orbit animation, you can see how when it returns out to the asteroid belt, the close approach to the Earth has changed its orbit and it's no longer returning to the same place it started. Because 2002 MN will circle around the sun and come past us again, the NASA orbital mechanics team will have to adjust the calculation in order to know whether it will ever pose a danger to Earth at some point in the future. So here we've zoomed in on the Earth-Moon system and we're looking down. You can see how close it came to the Earth that went over the top yeah. and how you can actually even see the bend in the trajectory. So it's a great example of how um, a close approach to the Earth, or in fact any planet, can be used to, or can change, significantly change in orbit. To know where an asteroid is likely to be in the future, you need a model of the solar system. Mechanical models that show the relative motions of the Sun and planets have been around since the early 18th century. They're called orreries. What the celestial mechanics at NASA had to do 
was create a new digital model. One that includes the gravitational attractions of all the planets and the sun. And all the other forces that can affect where an asteroid might go. You just compute what forces are acting on this particular asteroid from all the planets and, and many of the minor planets in the solar system and then uh, we can actually trace the motion of that object around the solar system uh, for hundreds of years. For scientists, the acid test of their mathematics came when a strange new comet raced toward Jupiter. A stream of cosmic bullets that would shock and amaze millions here on Earth. In the spring of 1993, the eyes of the world turned almost in unison towards a doomsday rock like no other. From the far side of the solar system, it flew in a death spiral toward the largest planet. Jean Schumacher, his wife Carolyn, and their colleague David Levy had discovered an odd-looking streak of light that turned out to be a fractured comet. 21 large chunks of icy rock and cosmic dust heading towards Jupiter. We knew we had something very unusual. It was so unusual we were a little unsure just what we were dealing with. NASA asked Paul Chodas and his team to calculate the orbit and predict whether this new comet would actually hit Jupiter. And it started off at some 60% and before long it was 90% and this was a year before impacts. As the impacts approached, we continued to predict not just the Im impact probability, which went very high, but where and when the comet fragments would hit the planet. And uh, it was a prediction months in advance, uh, and as we got closer and closer to the uh, impacts, I kept wondering, well, is, are the ma is the math right? Are, uh, will this actually happen the way it uh, was uh, predicted? A giant comet is on a collision course with Jupiter. Everybody on Earth who was paying any attention wanted to see if the comet would actually hit Jupiter. We have liftoff, liftoff of the Space Shuttle Endeavour on an ambitious mission to service the Hubble Space Telescope. NASA's Hubble Space Telescope set its sights on the planet, and the pictures of what happened next were truly stunning. Hey! Then the impacts occurred. We were uh, within minutes of getting the right uh, answer on the time of impact, and the location of impact turned out to be just right. Over the next week, 20 more fragments of the comet crashed into Jupiter, some leaving scars as large as the Earth. Bang on its cosmic schedule, the comet's first impact was recorded by NASA within the last hour. When fragment G slammed into Jupiter, releasing an amount of energy equivalent to about 6 million megatons of TNT. In the wake of SL9, a group of concerned scientists gathered in Italy for a brainstorming session. They created a brand new international organization called the Space Guard Foundation. Okay, I'm going to join. To promote the discovery and study of near-Earth objects. Some people imagine that there are lots of astronomers out there scanning the sky looking for incoming comets and asteroids. And, and that, of course, is not true. In fact, until recently, there was hardly anyone out there looking. It's going to glow for about a half an hour and set everything on fire around here. But whose job is it to defend planet Earth? Weapon scientists from the United States and Russia had already held a series of meetings and came up with their own ideas about how to deal with the impact threat. The military establishment under Star Wars had uh, created a whole lot of devices or at least concepts for weapons in space and devices in space. And in the early 90s, uh, when the Star Wars program was looking a little bit iffy, I think there was some motivation for them to try to apply their technology to this 
newly discovered uh, hazard from asteroids and comets. The military approach to the problem proved to be controversial. The notion of sending nuclear weapons into space generated an immediate backlash. Edward Teller was proposing that we blow up an asteroid to show that we could protect the, protect the Earth. And I, I thought that was a pretty crazy idea. Blowing up an asteroid with a big bomb uh, has a lot of problems associated with it, violating treaties, uh, taking a single asteroid and making a swarm of uh, smaller asteroids. Uh, it seemed like it was more of uh, interest in bombs than it was a serious interest in, in defending the planet. For NASA, on the other hand, uh, NASA obviously is the natural agency to discover the threat and the objects, but they say, no, planetary defense, that's, that's a military obligation and, and not an obligation of NASA. Not NASA, not the military. Just when it seemed planetary defense was nobody's job, a tiny speck in the sky would set off doomsday alarms around the world. On a winter's night, the 6th of December, 1997, a dim streak of light moving through the constellation Cancer was captured by a telescope in the Arizona desert. Big enough to destroy civilization as we know it, asteroid 1997 XF11 seemed to be heading towards Earth. The initial sighting by the Kitt Peak Observatory in Tucson, Arizona, was relayed to the Minor Planet Center at Harvard University in Cambridge where a computer made the first rough calculation of the orbit. They were pretty sure it would miss the Earth on this pass, but it would be coming round again, and it looked like there could be a problem in 30 years. There were indications of close approach to the Earth in 2028. That was about 45,000 kilometers, which really was rather, rather, rather close. With only a handful of sightings, the orbit calculation remained very rough. It was hard to tell where this rock was going. So Brian Marsden posted a bulletin asking astronomers around the world for more observations before the rock became too faint to see. I was saying, hey, uh, get your big telescopes onto this. On the one hand, we're only going to be able to observe it for another month or so. We want to improve the orbit calculation and find out exactly how close it is coming. But one line in the bulletin said that the chance of a collision was small, but it was not entirely out of the question. Within hours of the website posting, reporters discovered XF-11 and doomsday headlines screamed around the world. Because the close approach in 2028 would put the asteroid nearest to Europe, London newspapers focused on the exact moment life on Earth might possibly end. Pictures of it on the internet show it as a tiny moving blob. Scientists have calculated its path in the year 2028. Watch very carefully. September, October, October the 28th, the two coalesce. But at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in California, the orbital dynamics team thought there must be some mistake. To my great surprise, when we, uh, we ran our software, it said that the probability of impact of this uh, particular asteroid in 30 years was uh, essentially zero. As it turned out, the end of the world asteroid would miss the Earth. That big rock in space posed no threat after all. A frantic hunt through the archives at NASA had turned up photographs of XF-11 taken eight years earlier. And as soon as those were placed into the orbit determination process, they confirmed the fact that there was no chance that it could hit the Earth in 30 years. The public at large was not understanding uncertainty uh, in, in this. They wanted uh, you know, an immediate answer. Is it going to hit us or not? But people were paying attention. One side effect of the false alarm was that public and political awareness of the threat had been raised. Two months after XF-11, New hearings were held in Washington, and NASA was told to speed up the science of asteroid detection. Finally, it seemed, there was a political will to do something. 
Congress gave NASA a 10-year deadline to search the skies and get a fix on the largest of the doomsday rocks. They called it the Space Guard Survey. While astronomers geared up to search the skies, Hollywood was going into overdrive. I would go to every dinner party and I would say, are you aware what would happen if a comet was actually on a collision course with the Earth? Oscar-winning screenwriter Bruce Joel Rubin was hard at work on the remake of a sci-fi classic. The new film called Deep Impact would be a Steven Spielberg production. When we arrived at our hotel in New York, the porter was so incredibly careful, careless with our bags. And the room they gave us? It was, it was beautiful. A broom closet. But the, but the best part worst part was, was the, the shower. shower. My, My wife drying herself with the Egyptian cotton towel shower curtain to find that whole vacation, vacation for, her. for her. Don't just visit New York. Visit TripAdvisor New York. With millions of reviews, a visit to TripAdvisor makes any destination better. An army of scientists work desperately to build this giant rocket, this modern Noah's Ark, to carry a few picked survivors of our doomed civilization. I think the thing that was hardest for me was the realization that people would have to be chosen to survive. Let's take the ship away from them! Come on! Probably a very, very small percentage of human beings would be left on the Earth able to survive something of the intensity of the, the comet that hit and destroyed the dinosaurs. So I felt making this movie is not just a mission to tell a good story, it's to change minds. It's to let people go, this is something real. This can happen to us. This movie is a wake-up call. It's not just a Hollywood movie, it is pointing at you. As Hollywood released Deep Impact, telling the world in no uncertain terms that cosmic collisions were no longer just a cosmic joke, real-life professional asteroid hunters were making movies of their own. But instead of using cameras, they worked with delayed Doppler radar. Take the same technology behind a police radar system, jump the power to 400,000 watts, and you've got NASA's Deep Space Network with huge multi-dish systems like the Goldstone Tracking Station in California's Mojave Desert. This is the, the main room of the pedestal of DSS-14. The first time radar astronomer Stephen Ostro bounced a signal off a rock in space, a wobbling blot of pixelated data bounced back. What looks like digital gibberish spoke volumes to Steve Ostro. Radar really does, it does three things at once. One, it works at long wavelengths, so you're sensitive to structure on large scales and metal concentration. The other is you can make pictures. And you can't do this from the ground in any other way. You make pictures of objects, and then we take a sequence of pictures, and we go through a computational process to produce the 3D models. That's the second thing. The third thing is that it makes very precise measurements of distance and speed. When the 1,000-foot radar dish at Arecibo in Puerto Rico bounced a beam off an asteroid called Castalia, the data was translated into a 3D computer model. The very first radar movie showed how Castalia spins and revealed that it was actually two massive chunks of rock held together by weak gravity. Every time they made the trip to Goldstone for a new radar target, Ostro and his team were like kids reaching into a box of chocolates. They never really knew just what they would find. Asteroid Cleopatra, shaped like a dog bone, was roughly the same size as the state of New Jersey and was made almost entirely of metal. Echoes from asteroid Tutatis produced images of a rocky, cratered surface and a wobbling, tumbling spin. Uh, every single one of these objects that we've made a shape model of is very different. This is Tutatis. From a telescopic smudge of light, to a 3D shaped model, radar gave them physical details and the first clear idea of what asteroids are really like. In the year 2000, 
the radar movie crew developed a dark and mysterious new image. Asteroid 1950 DA. A big rock that gave everybody a bit of a shock. Once we got the radar data, we began the normal process of just seeing how far in the future we could predict this thing before the uncertainties in the orbit blur out. And in this case, we could go over uh, 880 years into the future. And what was startling about that case was uh, the impact probability turned out to be non-zero. Non-zero means there is a chance this rock could hit us. On March the 16th, in the year 2880, 1950 DA will cross the Earth's orbit. Will it hit us? The odds? 1 in 300. If 1950 DA does hit the Earth, the most likely point of impact would be at sea. Of all the big asteroids discovered thus far, this is the most dangerous one we know. Eric Asfaug and Stephen Ward have created a computer model of the impact. Yeah, it's kind of funny how this started. Uh, it was with that, the movie Deep Impact, and uh, I was getting phone calls. Lots of people were getting phone calls about the movie, whether it was accurate, the, the big cresting tsunami coming across. The concept here is that uh, this asteroid, which is about a kilometer across, will hit the ocean at 17,000 miles per hour, and it'll blow a hole in the ocean about 19 kilometers across and all the way to the bottom. And so when this huge hole of water gets blown in, into the ocean, the water will run back in again, and it overshoots and it collapses and overshoots many, many times, and each time it pumps out a wave. So it starts out hundreds of meters high, comes ashore on the coast of North America at about 50, 60 meters, up toward Canada, Grand Banks, it's about 40 meters, 20 meters here in the coast of South America, and about 15, 20 meters all the way over to Europe. These waves would run inland about four kilometers, so pretty much everything within four kilometers from the beach would be covered up repeatedly. And so we pretty much be wiped away like there's like a, you're scrubbing the floor, you know, you scrub <laughs> like this, and it's pretty much we all be carried back out. In February 2001, a NASA spacecraft called Near Schumacher made the first ever landing on a chunky, pockmarked rock named after the Greek god of love. Asteroid 433 Eros is 33 kilometers long and 13 kilometers wide, one of the largest near-Earth asteroids. The pictures were spectacular. The data will take years to process. Proving that they could land on an asteroid was a major achievement, but in the end, they still don't know much about what's inside. How dense, how tough, how brittle or crumbly is it? What would happen if they gave it a good shove? The surface appearance of any dark and mysterious object can be very deceiving. So these two spheres, as far as I can tell, have exactly the same mass, the same compressibility, uh, the same color. If I were a spacecraft orbiting these and these were asteroids, I'd be very hard pressed to tell which was which. Yet, if I dropped them from a height, one of them bounces. Really il illustrates the fact that one of these responds elastically and one of these responds like a lump of clay. And it's critical to really go and find out what's inside before we even start thinking about moving these things around. When a 3D model of the asteroid Castellia got smacked in a computer simulation, a problem occurred. An impact with the same energy as the Hiroshima bomb turned Castellia into a pile of rubble, but did not deflect its trajectory in any significant way. But there are other ways to apply force to deflecting an incoming asteroid. Using the power of the sun to push dangerous rocks out of the way may not be so far-fetched after all. This is a typical near-Earth asteroid. Its uh, name is Galevka. It's about half a kilometer across. It's a hazardous asteroid. Its uh, most likely fate is going to be to strike the Earth someday, uh, thousands of years from now. Modern-day researchers like Eric Asfaug say the idea of a giant orbital magnifying glass to burn space rocks could work. You create a vapor plume in one direction, and that starts the asteroid moving in the other. 
It's a very gradual process. It's not going to happen instantaneously. You need to know where this guy is 100 years or 50 years ahead of time. But if you do, you've got all the time in the world for a satellite to sit there, no human intervention whatsoever, and it'll gradually shove the asteroid into a different orbit and it'll miss the Earth. Some of the technology to do this already exists. Take an inflatable parabolic antenna the size of a tennis court, convert it to a solar collector, and use it to focus sunlight on an asteroid. The Russians have built and are testing a giant sail that captures the minute pressure of sunlight. Just attach the sail to an asteroid and let the rock hitch a ride to someplace else. But using the sun to save the Earth means waiting for nature to do the work. If we don't see an asteroid until the last minute, solar power would be too little, too late. A nuclear electric plasma engine could push an asteroid out of harm's way. The rocket technology at this NASA lab in Houston, Texas, could provide the power for a space tugboat. A group of astronauts and aerospace engineers is designing the B612 mission to prove that asteroid deflection can be done with existing technology. Uh, these are rockets that uh, have very tiny amounts of thrust, but um, they are so frugal in the use of propellant that we can keep the rocket going for periods of the order of a year. Building a better rocket engine is only the first step. Figuring out how to latch on to an asteroid, point it in the right direction, and push without losing control is the really tricky part. After years of research, NASA finally had it, the first complete draft of a plan, a demonstration mission, to save the planet. off the impact with the Earth 10 years later so that it misses the Earth and not just miss it randomly but miss it very precisely so that we don't simply pass on the problem to our grandchildren. <laughs> Midway through 2003 the Space Guard survey had reached the halfway point a little more than half of the kilometer size near-Earth asteroids had been located, and the news was mostly good. For the 60% that we have already found, I can tell you that there is not a single one that poses a danger. For the 40% that we have not yet found, I can tell you nothing. One could hit tomorrow. Not very likely, but until we've found them and cataloged them, we won't know. But finding the really big asteroids, those one-kilometer monster rocks capable of ending human civilization, is only the first part of the challenge. There are an estimated 50,000 smaller asteroids that are big enough to cause tidal waves or destroy vast regions of the Earth. A 200-meter asteroid happens maybe once every 10,000 years. But that's like 600 megatons to 800 megatons exploding in one place. Recall the small 60-meter rock that exploded over Siberia in 1908? Well, even though it could have destroyed a city like London or New York, rocks that small are not included in the current Space Guard survey, meaning no one is officially looking for them. Which of course, it's the same thing as saying that chances are enormous that a Tunguska-sized object will find us before we even see it coming. 
as happened in, in 1908. That is, that is likely to happen nowadays, that, that we won't see it coming. There has been talk of expanding the search to include smaller asteroids. It'll take more and bigger telescopes and, of course, more money. But until we do, we'll have no idea where those city killer rocks are. Evolution on Earth has proceeded in part because every so often a global catastrophe comes along, pushes the reset button, and new things happen. It wiped out the dinosaurs 65 million years ago, and at the time, we mammals were just furry little creatures burrowing around in the ground, and, and uh, an asteroid or a comet impact took out our principal competition. I guess we are saying implicitly, if not explicitly, that we want to do away with that natural cycle. We've had enough evolution. <laughs> we like ourselves on the top of the ladder. And we can do something which will change cosmic evolution from this point forward in terms of life on Earth. Dinosaurs ruled the Earth until a big rock wiped them out. The question is, will another rock do the same to humanity? Let's get a couple good pictures here. Humans are the first species with the potential to block a doomsday rock and switch off the evolutionary reset button. People very often say, look, you're just a doomsayer. You think that these awful things are going to happen. I'm not that way at all. I'm entirely optimistic. The way in which I view asteroid, asteroids and comets and the possibility of them hitting the Earth is that it's a great challenge. Thank goodness we've realized the hazard and the danger before the next one happens. It's given us time, we hope, to do something about it. Scientists can study the sky and find the dangerous rocks ahead of time. Astronomers can do the math and predict the orbits. People have the desire and the right stuff to do the job. There's a whole new field of science that could give humanity an option the dinosaurs never had. Got left hand downwind runway 22, the QNH and the QFE 1012. I love the northwest coast. Just look at that view. I grew up in Prestatic and I used to sunbathe on that beach down there and look up and see the aeroplanes coming in and out of Liverpool Airport and think, one day I want to fly a plane. It's taken me a long time to get there, but now here I am. I've recently qualified as a pilot, fulfilling my childhood dream, and this is the first time I've ever flown low over my home patch. What I didn't realise when I was growing up is that uh, North Wales is one of the hubs in the world for aeronautical engineering. And down there is where they build some of the best parts of aircraft in the world. Airbus Broughton is located on a massive 750 acre site in Flintshire. Here they build wings and then transport them on this extraordinary plane to the south of France. Everything they do is on a gigantic scale. And their latest groundbreaking design is taking the aeronautical world by storm. My little plane isn't as big, but she's just as loved. I'm flying in to find out how these brand new wings are setting a new benchmark standard for fuel efficiency. You're parking on Apron Bravo with the Beluga. So once runway vacated at Bravo, if you follow the marshal's instructions. It's cutting edge stuff. We may never fly in the same way again. And it could all be down to some Welsh wings. Broughton is famous for building wings. 
The wings of an aeroplane are critical to how the plane flies, its handling and its fuel efficiency. And this year they're celebrating 75 years since production first began on this site. Today they're supplying some of the most popular airlines in the world and that keeps around 6,000 Welsh workers busy. And I get to join them. So you're the man in charge here. Yeah, it's good to see you here. Welcome to Broughton. This is where we build A350 wings. Uh, the A350 is one of the most advanced aircraft in the world. Uh, it's made of advanced materials. 70% of the product is advanced materials. And 53% of that is carbon fibre composite. Carbon fibre is a form of soft graphite, just like what's found in the centre of a pencil. It's mixed with plastic resin to make carbon fibre composite. It's tough, lightweight, but extremely flexible. We're currently building one pair, two pairs per month, but by the end of this year we've got to get to five pairs per month. Within a year? That's a five times increase, that's correct. I understand you know a little bit about engineering, Carol. Compared to you, about that much. Would you like to join us? I'd love it. I really would love it. OK, great. The moment has come for me to get hands-on experience in building one of these wings. This uniform reminds me of when I was a, a very junior engineer at the uh, Dinorwick Power Station in Snowdonia. And of course we had the cap shoes or boots, the boiler suit or overalls, and the obligatory hard hat. Yes, sir. They call this the washing line and you can see why. Except here, we don't have clothes hanging down. We have the skins or the covers of the wings. This is the top cover and this one here is the much more curvy bottom skin. What's so remarkable about these is that they are the largest single pieces of carbon fibre composite ever made in the world. And that gives you some indication of just how revolutionary this place is. Good afternoon, Station 82. Uh, so to start with, uh, safety, okay, uh, no near misses, no accidents. Uh, it's the start of shift and we're all lined up for the team briefing. Some of us will be uh, supporting MSN 25, removal from jig. Uh, any issues? Right, thank you very much guys, have a nice afternoon. My first job is to move this two and a half ton carbon fibre top skin of the wing into the jig so we can work on it. To manoeuvre it around the factory we're using a special vehicle known as the AGV. Hi Carol, Hi, your yeah, turn to shine it. today. All right, then. Are you going to help us out? Yeah, moving, moving, the the moving the cover. I'm going to move the cover today. Is that for me? Yep. I hope it's the right size. <laughs> I have got my certificate in Good. forklift truck driving. It's well, not quite the that's same, not going to help us today. <laughs> so put this around my waist. This is the or... box. This is the dead arm box. What does that Colleague, mean? The colleague's going to be driving. What does the dead arm box mean? Whatever. If there's a problem and we're yeah. swinging and we, yeah. we're coming to a ballard, if you think it's unsafe, yeah. take your hand off that yeah. and the machine, AGV will Just stop, cuts out. cut out straight away. And that's worth millions, isn't it? Uh, I'd guess, I, I think, possibly 1.1 million, too. Yeah. So... One, two. That's yeah, it's, it's only carbon fibre, right? It's only one so. <laughs> yeah. OK, good to go. Right, I'm sticking with you, Russell. Yeah. This is brilliant. The way this and moves. This is it's fantastic. These wheels are incredible. And I think it's roughly about £8,000 a wheel. Is it really? Yeah. This is an extremely delicate manoeuvre, and you can feel the pressure. The team knows that one false move could cost a fortune. Take your hand off now. Please. Stop straight away. It's looking like possibly may have to move this move frame. This. This AGV not only manoeuvres, but it can also lift this heavy and expensive piece of wing. You're going over the top? Yeah. First flight. <laughs> First flight, yeah. Luckily, it has just enough reach to clear the frame. It's been designed by the Americans, is that right? I think that's German. Kuka, I think Kuka's Say that again, what was it? German. <laughs> Stan Gordon. I <laughs> know, oh, yeah. <laughs>
about how it works. So I'm going to draw my wing here and generally on a wing the curvature on the top of the wing is greater than on the bottom and there's a reason for that. So this is my airflow. So when a wing is moving through the air you see that a dot on this bit of air coming over has to go all the way over the top of the wing. Similar dot just travels underneath and then they meet up at the back and then on they go. Now the thing is when this one going over the top of the wing travels it has to go faster than the bit of air on the bottom. So what you get is you have high pressure on the bottom, low static pressure on the top and the high pressure pushes the wing upwards and that is the force that we call lift or when you're looking at aeroplane I call it magic. It doesn't matter if it's a jumbo jet or a bumblebee, they each achieve lift in the same way. Now, if you don't believe me, you can do this at home. Get a bit of paper, okay, static pressure the same, the weight of the paper is hanging down. When I blow across the top, the pressure on the top will reduce and we will have lift. You see? But once in the air, the shape of the wing determines the way the aeroplane flies. The best way to demonstrate is with a bit of aeronautical origami. I think you're in a bit of a neater folder than me. Uh, oh, is that what it no. is? You're after speed. And as a former fighter aircraft designer, Roy Scott knows all about it. One of the main principles is, is the angle of the wing relative to the fuselage, yep. the body. So, for example, here, what we're looking for is a very stable flight on a passenger uh, aircraft. What we do is slightly fold the wings upwards to give that upwards effect and that's called a dihedral wing dihedral effect. dihedral effect a p wings yeah yeah uh, and the harrier jump jet for example where we want an unstable aircraft because it can roll you worked on that as well that's correct you? yes down yeah. in farnborough the wings are formed downwards in an anhedral effect so if you look at fighter aircraft you can see that yeah okay like so that. mine theoretically should go the furthest and mine and should do the rolling and spinning and all of that okay, okay. Three, two, one. Yes! Yay! <laughs> so yours was spinning it's quite spinning, a bit. Yeah. Mine somehow nosedived. <laughs> so maybe with a secret paper clip in there. Yeah, that's what it was. Airbus is one of the biggest employers in Wales. Building wings keeps a workforce of over 6,000 busy. There are currently only a few completed A350s in service, but the pressure is on to supply 780 pairs of wings on order to customers such as Qatar Airways. But this factory has a long history of working against the clock. This is a bomber factory in Britain. The workers have arranged with their management and their joint production committee to build a bomber in the record time of 30 hours. The clock starts this is brought in back in 1943. Two of the Here, a team from the factory are attempting to set a world record to build a whole Wellington bomber aeroplane. You can get some idea now of the size of the bomber. It's almost 65 feet long. During the Second World War, while the men were fighting on the front line, women were clocking into factories all over Britain to help in the war effort. The progress they are making speaks for itself. For it's only 10 o'clock, one hour from the starting time. Betty Weaver was one of the women trying to smash that world record. She was recruited to work here from the local co-op. She's 94 now. The first day I turned up, we had, there was two of us together. We had our photograph taken to put on a pass. I was under the largest white boiler suit I've ever seen in my life <laughs> and a wooden box with tools in it. And I didn't know which one to use or which end to start. Mm -hmm. But I was thoroughly taught for about three weeks. Yeah. And uh, that was it. I was on my own. So here was this massive production line and little Betty... A big Betty. <laughs> 
So which job were you given then and the whole construction? What was your job on it? Well, it was the intercom inside the plane yeah. where the crew kept in touch with each other. Okay. Two ladies before me used to run the cable through the plane. Yeah. And there was a, a box of fed at each station yeah. so that the pilot could keep in touch with all his the all rail the gunner, crew, yeah. the navigator, the wireless operator, second pilot, yeah. and I connected the boxes up. And did that remain your job through yes, the war then? Yes, all the way through. So everybody specialised in one exactly. thing? Exactly, yeah. Because the wings and the fuselage were fabric, weren't they? Basically, yes. Yeah, yeah. The cover of yes. them was fabric. Yeah, it was linen was that it? they stitched on, yeah. and they had to do 12 stitches to an inch. And that's if there was one stitch missing, it had to be undone no. and redone. Yes. Yeah. And then it was doped yeah. over the top until it was like the skin of a drum, more or less. And it's hard. Thing. Yeah. yeah. And so the inspectors very, checked very on that. Yeah. Very strict. Yeah. Very strict. Had to be, didn't yeah, it? Yeah. Exactly. No. Men's lives depend on them. Absolutely. Yeah. Betty and her fellow workers gave up their weekend to try to break that world record. Here comes the test pilot, Gerald Winnie, a really amazed man. He was planning to fly the bomber this afternoon, but so fast has this aircraft been completed that they got him out of bed to put the bomber through its paces. It was wartime propaganda at its very best, aimed to bolster spirits at home and put the wind up the enemy. So did they break the record? The record? Yes, they broke it, those workers. They said they'd build a bomber in their spare time in 30 hours. Its wheels lifted from the ground in exactly 24 hours and 48 minutes. And I wonder if that thing got off the ground. I'll never know. I really don't. Yeah. There we are. Yeah. Broughton has a long history of producing aeroplanes. In 1949, the Hornet took to the skies after de Havilland took over the site. The Heron was built in the 1950s, and the Beaver and the Chipmunk were also built in Broughton. Some aircraft became flying legends, like the Mosquito and the Comet Mark IV. This sleek silver plane was the fastest airliner of its day to cross the Atlantic. Now then, this is the most modern production area of yeah. wings yeah. so uh, and I couldn't let Betty leave without a glimpse of the latest look. wings and look at all of this here just go yeah. to this barrier yeah. you're right yeah. <laughs> That's wonderful. that is one big piece of material it's not put together in any way it's just made like one piece and that is the bottom of a wing there that's as big as a Wellington bomber would have been yeah, it, it is yeah but there's no one stitching fabric in here. But... <laughs> Thank goodness. Oh, good job. Unbelievable. I can't help but be astonished by Betty's story. You can imagine all of those young girls and men learning these incredible new skills in this, you know, strange place, building bomber aircraft at a ridiculous rate quite incredible but you know we should all be thankful that they did do it our Welsh wing is beginning to take shape with the top skin fixed on it's time for the next phase of work to take place and how things have changed from when I started out as an engineer as a woman I was a rare sight in a male-dominated world. But here at Broughton, I've seen more women engineers at work than ever before. One of them is Bridie Welsh, and she's the expert when it comes to the skeleton of the wing. Underneath, what you've got here is your spar, here. made of carbon fibre. And this goes the whole length of the wing. The whole length of the wing. Yeah, to provide and stability. Exactly. Um, and then we've got our ribs in between. Yeah. So what's interesting about these is they're made from aluminium instead of carbon fibre because the loads, uh, the forces are quite complicated. Bridie and her team designed the complex internal structure of the wing. That's because these wings do more than just lift the plane off the ground. They're also the fuel tanks for the aircraft. 
Fuel tank starts right at the centre yep. uh, and moves out to around about rib 28. And how much fuel did the wings take? It's just under 100,000 litres. Is it really? Yeah. It's massive, isn't it? <laughs> it's a lot of fuel. Yeah. And when the bottom is on, the fuel is actually touching up it's, against yeah. this, isn't it? Against this aluminium. So how does that operate? Do you have fuel pumps that take it through? What we have is baffles, they're um, holes within the ribs which allow the fuel to move throughout the rib base. Without it just being one great big slosh, yes. I suppose. Yeah. Right? So, you know, when you go out on the town, do you go into Chester? I do. Okay. Um, and, <laughs> and the lads chatting you have a beautiful young girl and they're going, what do you do? And you say, I'm an engineer. What do they say? They do get a bit of a shock, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm <love> surprised. <laughs> Older commercial aircraft have up to eight fuel tanks. The A350 only has three. One tank is under the main body of the aircraft, while the other two are in the wings. Between them, they hold enough fuel to fly from London to New York and back again. Oh. Oh. Just coming up through an inspection hatch. I'm inside the wing now, the, the big end, if you like, of the fuel tank. Lots and lots of ribs uh, going, stretching a long way in that direction. You know, it's remarkable to think that this will be sealed and the fuel inside here will go through the pumps and so on into the engine and no one will ever come into here again. So Beth, there are these FOD signs everywhere, foreign object debris, so none of yeah. it's allowed through so, there. Nothing is allowed into there that isn't already accounted for on our sheets. So I'm going to have to ask you to empty your pockets of any personal belongings, okay. keys, Phew. phones. <laughs> and put them all into this locker here. So okay. anything that we don't So anyone's need. working in this area, they've got to get rid of yeah. all this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So anything that we don't need on the aircraft, we decant into what we call our FOD lockers. Yeah. Um, any tooling that is needed, we account for on the sheet, so it's signed in and it's signed back out and this ensures the security. Brilliant, the okay, am I allowed to go in? Like yes, this? so now we can walk into the FOD area. So if I just pass you this way, right. so what we're going to do is just clean an area to make sure that the cleanliness... Okay, so, so, if I, so if I wanted to clean under here, I can't actually see that, so... Yeah, so this is why we use a mirror, just to make sure that we can get a continued look around yeah, all of the products, so you can see every single... Yeah, I know, it's not like being at home, area. is it? Because you can't sort of, you know, you're quite restricted in how you can move. It is, so the mirror is really important to make sure that we don't miss any part of this bay yeah. when we're doing an inspection so you can see every angle. Yeah, oh yeah, I can see it's picking up. So how small, because I've got quite a bit there already, how small an object um, would you be looking for? So we're looking for the tiniest of fibres. So when we're doing this clean and this inspection, we're looking for any of the residue from the manufacturing processes. Yeah. We were also doing trials and tests with our suppliers to get our wipes to be as low linting as possible. So, so they don't leave fibres. So even the wipes either. that you're cleaning with wow. don't leave fibres. What are you like when you clean your house? <laughs> It's spotless, it's to the same standard. <laughs> <Right answer. laughs> it's ingrained in you when you've been on the shop floor. Yeah. So, after several months in production, the 32 metre wing sits on the factory floor. Tomorrow morning, it will leave Wales and head towards the south of France. It's the end of shift, and I've heard from my new buddies there's a celebration around the corner in the social club. From the bygone days of Vickers Armstrong to Haviland and British Aerospace, veterans and ex-workers are getting together to celebrate 75 years of aircraft production at Broughton. I've been invited along, and there's no mistaking the pride still felt by the people here tonight. Everyone, in their own way, loved working here. We were shooting at work, and it, we were like a big family. Honestly, it, it was like a big family. I worked in the plan room, giving all the drawings out to the men when they came. Members of your family worked here then? Oh yes, my sister, my brother-in-law, my late husband, my son, myself, my daughter-in-law, the whole family. Everybody. I've been admiring all these 
black and white photographs that I are know around. Which are mine. Which are yours, I know. Thirty years I was in charge. Were here, you? Of the of, it's a, of an archive. Of so uh, yeah. it's all up. I didn't realise you were a North Wales girl. I'm a North Wales French girl, girl. Born and bred. And old Betty's having a lovely time as well. An absolutely beautiful evening, but it's time to go to bed. I've got work again tomorrow. This site never rests. Our wing is preparing to take its first flight. Today it's leaving Broughton and is being transported to Toulouse in the south of France. And it's catching a lift on the strangest looking aeroplane you will ever see. The company's got five of them, and it's used to transport various pieces of a new aeroplane to Toulouse, where they assemble all the wings and the fuselage and everything all goes to Toulouse. The last and most critical job of loading a wing onto the beluga is down to the team with a tiny bit of help from me. Are you ready, boys? Yeah. We're going forward. Yeah. Keep that on firmly, unless I shall stop, just let it go. It might have a fault with the aircraft. You've spelt forward wrong. <laughs> and I've literally only got inches on each side to play with. Can you see how close? The edge of the wing is there to the aircraft and at the other end. This is the widest part of the, the wing, the root, you know, the bit that attaches to the fuselage. I just guess. This is a big plane. It's the company's workhorse. But despite its size, it can only carry one A350 wing at a time. I've managed to squeeze on board to help deliver our wing. After a two-hour flight, the Beluga touches down in Toulouse, in the south of France. It's here that Airbus receives thousands of parts from suppliers in Spain and Germany, and the construction of the aeroplane begins, just like a massive Meccano set. Our wing is now carefully unloaded and transported, ready to be attached to the fuselage of the A350.
Getting the chance to step inside these extraordinary manufacturing sites makes me realize just how clever we humans can be. I've been told when the paperwork accompanying the aircraft is as heavy as the plane itself, they've got things right. So, when we jump onto an aeroplane to go on our holidays, most of us just take the whole thing for granted. This is my, uh, my first look inside. Oh, wow. That is stunning. I've never seen anything like this before. I mean, we can see the insulation, all the different coloured insulation. That's to keep us warm as passengers and to stop the noise from coming in as well. And then all the seats go in here. You can see some of the traps already laid down. This is 67 metres long, the whole fuselage, which is, if you take an Olympic-sized swimming pool, the length of that, and then you add on about 17 metres, about 50 feet. That's how long it is. And this flies over oceans. It's extraordinary. So where are the wings? Well, they're fixed in between the doorways. So you can see here that they're at the front of this door. And doors to manual. And the second set is graceful, cool, if you like. But that's not why they're fitted. You see, what happens when the aeroplane is flying, you have a much greater static pressure underneath the wing than you do on top. That's how you get lift. That's how the aeroplane rises. But the problem comes at the wing tip because when these two different pressures of air come together, they create mini tornadoes behind the aircraft, vortices. That creates what's called drag or air friction. And what that means when you're flying a plane is that you need more power to go at the same speed. And if you need more power, you need to use more fuel. To solve this problem, engineers turn His wingspan is around two meters and he is a bird of endurance because he has to stay on the wing for hours on end looking for his prey and he can only do that by using as little energy as possible. Now the A350 engineers have been studying effectively the ruthless efficiency of his wings and using that natural technology or elements of it in the design of the aircraft. So we're going to use, yes we are, and you're going to behave, a slow motion camera to record him flying and then play it back to you and you can see exactly what happens. example really perfect aerodynamics so an eagle built for endurance has to fly on the wing for very many hours doesn't want to use too much fuel no its own energy that's effect. right yeah. and it's yeah. exactly the same principle that's replicated with the wings of the a350 that's, yes well light it, it, with a composite it, it's the very light wing it means we can adopt some new strategies because we're now using the carbon fiber yeah um, and we couple that with this more detailed understanding of the, the specifics of the wing shape to, to get the minimum drag we can. 
what the Eagle has managed to achieve is the perfect match between a very light, efficient structure yeah. and a very efficient aerodynamic shape with the tips slightly turned up to reduce drag. Just as the A350 has the wing just, lips? Just as we've done on the 350. Yeah. Yeah. And you can see the similarities straight away when you see the shots of the, the Eagle as it comes towards us. How it mimics, well, no, we're mimicking its shape. Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> uh, yes. Um, it's not mimicking the A350. It, it got it right several thousand years ago. It's still with us, so it must be right. It must be right. And as we've evolved over 40 years of Airbus wings, you can see innovations coming in, not, not just in the way we've adapted the shape, but going beyond that to see how the bird actually controls that shape, how it controls itself in flight. Uh, and we're now adapting those things into the wings on the 350 as well, so it reacts to its environment. Maybe not quite as effectively as the Eagle, but we're getting there. Yeah. And when he's coming into land, flaps down. Flaps down, wheels out. <laughs> wheels out. Down. Eyes on the target. There's <laughs> a good boy. There's a good boy. The new design of the A350 wing reduces fuel burn by 25%. And over half of that saving is by adding these small yet ingenious winglet devices. It has a huge impact on the environment, a greener and more efficient flight, thanks to the Eagle. It's remarkable to think that a whole A350 plane takes just months to build from a jigsaw of individual parts from factories all over Europe. And here it is, the first aircraft they've designed and built, which is more than half, 53% in fact, carbon fibre. And I'm standing under one of the incredible wings all the way from Wales. And you think inside the, the journey in terms of the story that that wing has made. You know, we've got the ribs in there, we have the spar, we have the stringers. It's just stunning. And of course, right at the very end, the upturned wings of the Eagle, the winglets, which make this aircraft so incredibly efficient. One of the best things of all for me is that I get to be one of the very first passengers on board the prototype. This is one of the five A350 test planes to be built, and it's still being used by engineers to test the aircraft to its limits. And where better to go than straight to where I feel at home, the cockpit. Peter Chandler is the chief test pilot at Airbus. He was the brave man who took the very first A350 to the skies in 2014. Some impressive displays here, Peter. What are you testing in that first test flight? That, that first test flight, uh, in fact the first two flights, we were what we call opening the flight envelope. So the normal flight envelope, that's the from the low speed to the high speed and from low altitude up to high altitude. Just checking the handling of the airplane so that we could actually identify the, the natural characteristics of the airplane. What element of uh, the wings has made the most significant difference, do you think, to the A350? I mean, the design of the wing is state of the art in terms of the aerodynamics. And the fact that we have the ability just to very slightly extend flaps during cruise, so it's, uh, it's basically changing very slightly the camber of the wing, only by maybe uh, one, one or two degrees extension of the, uh, the flaps. And this is interesting because the control mm. column is over to, well, to the right here, to the left, yes. if you're yeah. the captain. Yes, since the mid-80s with the A320, we've had these side sticks as the, uh, the, the means of controlling the airplane. Do you um, like flying with them? I, I, I find it very comfortable and it just cleans up the cockpit so much you've got yeah. a nice clear view. Um, and of course the other advantage of having the side stick, if I could just show you, is yes. that uh, it allows us ah. to have a, a table which has two, two modes. We have a keyboard in there which is the interface which we can use for, for example, typing requests for weather. And perhaps the more important setting is that which allows you to eat <laughs> very comfortably, <laughs> which is a, a major concern for all airline pilots. Ladies and gentlemen, in preparation for takeoff, please fold away your table, ensure your seat back in the upright position. Thank you very much for your attention. We're taxiing out to the runway now, and the pilot, the captain, has changed the curvature of the wing. So he's put the slats at the front down slightly, the flaps at the back down slightly, 
and that means that we can take off at a much lower ground speed than we would without this happening and that's because it provides greater lift at a slower speed so now oh, here we go off we go full throttle he needs to get to what's called the speed of rotation so that he can pull back on the stick the wings will lift us into the air it's going to be beautiful a350 welsh wings so quiet the engine i'm sitting right next to the engine and up we go how beautiful it's very quiet inside i've got my decibel counter here it's showing around about 75 76 decibels which is well, if you consider that a normal conversation is around about 70 decibels, that's not bad. But the beauty of the two engines here and the whole configuration of the aircraft is what's called the noise footprint outside. So, you know, when you're sitting at home and you live near an airport, how noisy is the aircraft when it's taking off, particularly when it's at full throttle? And generally, with this aircraft, it's so quiet that the noise footprint is held within the boundary of the airfield, which is astonishing. I'm not in the cockpit. I'm in yeah. front of a, what we call the flight engineer station. Uh, from that station, my job is to conduct the test. So, of course, I'm not able to handle the aircraft because no. I have no stick, I have no first levers. <laughs> yeah. What kind of things would you be telling the pilots to do? So, the, the first test we have to do in the, the, the first month after the first flight is to do uh, what we call stalls. We have to stall the aircraft, which, may, which means that we have to bring the aircraft to a given point where it does not fly anymore. Okay, so that isn't, because so a lot of people when they hear stall, they think of their engine in their car stalling. It's yeah. nothing to do with the no. engines. It's all to do with the wings. Exactly. Yes. Finding the aerodynamic stalling point is one of the most important safety characteristics of any aircraft. It's something every pilot has to learn to recover from, but thankfully, Stefan isn't going to be doing it today. Do you want to come? Setting the VORs and, yeah. Like the needles, <laughs> much more difficult. Than yes, absolutely. Do you really like flying this plane? Oh, yes. Do you? It's a very beautiful plane and yeah. it handles very well, so uh, uh, all the pilots are delighted to fly it. Yes. This is where my story ends. It's been an experience full of surprises and unexpected discoveries. But my full appreciation of how much goes into building an aircraft has only just begun. I'm back in Broughton, and sadly the time has come for me to book my own takeoff slot and fly off home. This airfield has been at the cutting edge of aeronautical engineering for 75 years, and it had a golden age back in the 1940s. But it seems to me as though it's now within a new golden era. It really is at the forefront of aircraft design on a global scale, and it's fantastic, because it's where I grew up. <laughs>